What's up, everybody? Jensen Cummings here. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. Today is another installment of Best Served on Film, presented by Bucha Products, friends of ours in Longmont, Colorado. And we are talking the art of fermentation with Sandor Katz, the one and only. Sandor, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you. All right. Good, so we joked before, be I feel like we should just talk about soccer instead of fermentation, you know, <laughs> just to like throw people a loop. But clearly, I mean, an icon for so many of us chefs that that take fermentation very seriously. And I uh, want to have you just tell people for the few people that don't know kind of your body of work, you know, fermentation revivalist. Talk about kind of what your position in the whole ecosystem of food, agriculture, beverage, fermented foods, what, what kind of is your position? Sure. Okay. So, um, um, you know, for, for anyone who might not know exactly what fermentation is, fermentation is the microbial transformation of food. Um, you know, people have been practicing fermentation in every part of the world for thousands of years. Um, but it's only in the last 150 years that science has, you know, really be, you know, definitively begun to understand the process of fermentation as the transformative action of microorganisms. Um, um, everybody everywhere eats products of fermentation every day, but over the course of the last hundred years or so, uh, more and more of it has sort of disappeared from the fabric of our lives and, um, you know, disappeared behind factory doors. So when I call myself a fermentation revivalist, you know, it's really, um, you know, my work is all about, um, uh, demystifying fermentation, trying to make fermentation practices accessible so people who are interested can feel confident to um, play with them in their own kitchens or the restaurant chefs uh, uh, in, in their kitchens. Um, and so, um, you know, I really do see what I'm what I'm doing is reviving these skills that, you know, in, in, a, in a time not so long ago were extremely common and widespread, if not practiced in every kitchen, they were practiced in every community and people at least had a vague awareness of what they involved. Um, but, um, you know, more and more people have no idea and became, became afraid of it, uh, project yes. all of their fear of bacteria onto the idea of fermenting food. And so, um, you know, really my work is about trying to calm people down and, um, you know, make them see how easy and accessible fermentation really is. Yes, and fermentation can sound scary. You mentioned it just very quickly that people interact with fermentation basically every day. And so as somebody who's been out there promoting in the work, selling fermented products for a lot of years, people go to stinky, funky, sour kimchi and these, these things, which are a version of it, yes, yet the chocolate that you're eating, the coffee, the yogurt, these are all fermented products as well. So they are ubiquitous even in today's industrialized food. We just don't think about them in this very of the earth with your hands mentality that you have. And that's very much what you've brought to the forefront of kind of the culinary community and then kind of the avid home fermenters, be it people making their first sauerkraut, be it a kombucha, be it making your own yogurt. So I think that's fascinating. I want to take people way back. What's the first product that you ever fermented? What was the light bulb moment for you? Well, I mean, my gateway into fermentation was sauerkraut. Um, uh, you know, I mean, as a kid, I loved pickles. Uh, and I would say, you know, pickles and sauerkraut, you know, sort of gave me uh, the, the, the taste for lactic acid. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, I was not watching my grandmother making her own sauerkraut or, 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 or pickles. We, you know, we were buying them. Um, but, um, in 1993, I moved from New York city, which is where I grew up to rural Tennessee. And among the dramatic changes in my life at that time is I started gardening. And the first season that I was gardening, I was such a naive city kid that it had never occurred to me that in the garden, all of the cabbage would be ready at about the same time. And so when I faced that, um, you know, predictable situation, I mean, we had a beautiful row of cabbage that first year that I was gardening, um, I decided that I'd better learn how to make sauerkraut because I did have a vague understanding that sauerkraut had something to do with preserving cabbage. Um, and I learned from the joy of cooking how to make sauerkraut. And, um, you know, I couldn't believe how 
simple it is um, and uh, how delicious that was. And that just made me want to experiment. Like, oh, could I do the same thing with radishes uh, and carrots? And um, oh, could I make yogurt? Um, um, oh, uh, uh, you know, what is this sourdough that I've heard of? You know, can I make can I make bread without adding a packet of yeast? And I just started playing around with other realms of fermentation and um, you know, really went down the rabbit hole and um, um, experimented very, very widely. And my, my friends gave me this nickname, which, uh, you know, I use as a social media uh, um, handle, Sandor Kraut, um, uh, because I was always showing up with sauerkraut. Um, and, uh, uh, and I'm still experimenting. I mean, you know, my, my, my kitchen at any given time is just, you know, full of, um, you know, uh, old friends that I've done a hundred times and, uh, you know, new experiments of things I'm trying to learn about. Yeah, and let's touch on experiments again. Somebody who you know had a, a test kitchen where we did hundreds and hundreds of different experiments. So many of them started in 2012 when your book, The Art of Fermentation, came out, and I got my hands on it that first year, and we just fermented everything in my kit, everything, and a lot of it did not turn out well. We were just experimenting. We really wanted to find those bumpers. We really wanted to find the thresholds of what's possible. And so this book, just touch on why The Art of Fermentation, your book, was the important work. And this is a seminal work for anybody who doesn't know. It laid the groundwork for so much of fermentation. And we see you go to Whole Foods, you go to your local supermarket, you go to your little kind of boutique specialty shop. We all see sauerkrauts and kimchi and fermented pickles and these things. Even eight years ago, this was not the norm at all. So you were starting very much a movement. So let's talk about that. The book itself, why? Why did you write the book? Well, okay. So first I need to preface it by saying that I published the first book, uh, wild fermentation that came yes. out in 2003, um, and um, you know that's what really sort of set me on this traje trajectory as a fermentation revivalist. And you know what began as a book tour to promote that book, you know, really never stopped uh, until COVID. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I mean, I learned very quickly that there's a hunger for information about fermentation that, you know, a lot of people have memories of a fermentation, uh, a ritual that their grandparents had, or people whose families came from some other part of the world, when they would visit that part of the world, they would witness fermentation. And so, you know, there's just a, there, there's been a lot of curiosity about fermentation and I, and, um, you know, so, so anyway, I, you know, I've, I've gotten to do all of this traveling, meeting other fermentation fermentation enthusiasts, meeting chefs who are experimenting in their kitchens, people with maybe more culinary vision than, than, than I have, meeting people from different parts of the world. And so I would say my education has been ongoing. And so at a certain point, I realized that I needed to publish a, um, you know, a, a, a more thorough book. Wild Fermentation is a wonderful introduction to fermentation, but I was learning about so many other kinds of fermentations, other traditions, other ways of doing things that I just thought I needed to put something, um, you know, bigger, more, more thorough. I mean, I, 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 w I won't call it comprehensive. I mean, I could, th I think I could do this work for another 50 years and, and, and not be able to produce a comprehensive work because, you know, fermentation is elaborated in so many different ways. I mean, there's nearly infinite possibility in the realm of fermentation. Um, everything we eat can be fermented in, 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 a, in a variety of different ways. So, you know, you, sort of in the end, if you get interested in it, you have to experiment. And of course, as you've pointed out, if you experiment a lot, not every experiment is going to be a success, but some of them will. And there's incredible innovation happening right now. And, you know, people applying ancient fermentation processes that have been used on particular set of ingredients onto different ingredients. And, um, uh, you know, people are just doing, uh, you know, just a lot of exciting, innovative, um, you know, cross pollinated uh, uh, work right now. And I, I find it very exciting. All right. Give us one experiment you had that you thought was going to turn out beautiful and it was inedible. Give us one. Um, well, I mean, um, um, you know, I, I've had I've had a long trajectory with um, fermenting uh, uh, tofu, making yes. uh, um, furu, 
um, um, which is like a you know, pickled tofu, but the basis of that is mao tofu, which is a moldy tofu. And you know, in China, at every market, you see these trays of you know white hairy mold on tofu that like just looks like a cloud. And the first couple of experiments that I did, where I just used a bed of straw or a, um, a squash leaf as the base and didn't use any particular starter, I got like you know bright bright uh, red, orange, yellow molds. And, you know, in general, bright color molds you don't want to play over play around with because some of them can be extremely toxic. Right. So, you know, those went right into the compost. But, you know, now I have, you know, I've figured out how to do it and, um, uh, you know, had some really wonderful experiences uh, uh, with Mao Dofu and, and, and Furu. Um, and um, um, look forward to sharing more information about about those processes. Good. I got, I'm glad we got to get really practical. If you see colored mold, do not eat that mold. I think that's I think that's an, just a simple thing. If it's if it's white and fluffy, you're usually okay. If it is red and slimy, run away. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. <laughs> uh, I, I think that's very good. Uh, you mentioned China, and so. Uh, we have it in the comments. I want to make sure people go and check out your YouTube page. And you did a series where the People's Republic of Fermentation, right, where you traveled yeah. to China with uh, people in Colorado that are familiar with the Flatirons Food Film Festival, know Mara King and the work that she did, uh, Ozuke, her, her company that was bringing krauts and kimchi into the Colorado market. So talk about that work for a little bit, because it was very, very fascinating. And exactly the tofus you're talking about is some of the products you were highlighting on that trip. Sure. So, I mean, I, I met Mara because she was a student of mine. She was she was in one of my workshops. We we totally hit it off, uh, kept in touch. And um, Mara grew up in Hong Kong. Her mother still lives in Hong Kong. And um, uh, her, her mother had been visiting this um, uh, village in Guizhou. For many years and developed relationships there and um, uh, they did a lot of fermentation that Mara's mother was always telling her about so um, you know uh, um, a few years ago 2016 um, Mara and I and her mother organized a trip to go visit the village in November at uh, uh, fermentation time um, and uh, we brought along with us a, a wonderful filmmaker, Matias Sokoboto, and he documented it. And we produced a series of um, it's about eight, ten minute, roughly ten minute videos. They're on my YouTube channel, um, and um, you know, just documenting different fermentation processes that we encountered there. Um, Let's talk about the the weird factor because fermentation as a whole has this this sense of very stinky, funky things. And there's absolutely some of that. Yet there are, are so many just sweet and like delectable and silky smooth and all, all of these characteristics that I find that you find. And then you take it into other cultures. I think this is fascinating. Every culture in the world has some kind of fermented foods and some kind of fermented beverages. They are absolutely staples of every cultural, historical diet throughout time. So I, I want to touch on that a little bit because for the American palate, you start talking about hairy tofu, we, we lost them, completely lost them. So I want to touch on that a little bit. What are some of the products that you tried for the first time that were a breakthrough for you that you thought might not hit your palate? And I know yours is a little bit more complex than some of us, but that you really said this is a gateway drug for people to get into understanding fermentation from a food culture like China, the most diverse food culture in the world. Uh, talk about that a little bit. Well, I mean, I mean, you know, personally, I mean, I'll always challenge myself to try what I see other people eating. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't mean that I always like love it or can relate to it uh, uh, in the first bite. Um, but I'm always just like trying to see where people find their pleasure. And, you know, I think if we think about a lot of familiar fermented foods and beverages, um, they are acquired tastes. I don't think anybody is born loving beer. I don't think anybody is, is born loving coffee. I think if we, you know, look at the range of cheeses, um, you know, sure. I mean, you know, everybody who, who, who can tolerate it, you know, generally likes um, um, a mild cheddar cheese. But once you start getting into, you know, Roquefort cheese, it's a much narrower range of the cheese eating population that, that enjoys it. Right. And, um, you, you know, so we all go through a process of like tasting things multiple times in order to find 
the, the, the pleasure that we can relate to. So, I mean, I'm, I'm really trying not to like, you know, exoticize other people's delicacies with like, you know, the, the, the ew factor. Um, but, um, you know, I think that a lot of the flavors of fermentation are acquired tastes. And, you know, I'll tell you the first time that I ate natto, this, um, you know, Japanese fermented soybeans, I did not like it, but now I love natto. I mean, I make it all the time. I eat it all the time. I, I relish the flavor and, and, and the texture of it. Um, uh, Swedish sour strumming, which is a, a herring uh, fermented at a very low salt brine that gets a, you know, it gets a sort of extreme aroma. Um, and the first time I, I tried it, like the, the smell made me think like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to keep this down. But the aftertaste was really so compelling that I found found myself waiting around to have a second taste. And, you know, the thing is, like with a lot of strong flavored foods, you're not just taking a huge bite of the strong flavored food on its own. It's, uh, you, you know, it's contextual. Like you take a flatbread, you put some sour cream, some onion, a little bit of the sour strumming. Um, you know, you have a little aquavit to wash it down. And, um, you know, so it's a context like you know if you if somebody gave you a glass of fish sauce you know and you tried to drink a glass of fish sauce you know i think most of us would really be gagged by that but that's not the way you use fish sauce if you use a little bit of it um you know as as, as a flavoring in something you're cooking um you know or or in a salad i mean it can just add a layer of flavor complexity and i think that you know with 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 um uh, fermented tofu with you know, it's, it's all over the place. Fermented tofu is as varied as cheese is. And right. so you can find very mild versions. You can find, you know, very um, extreme versions. And, you know, the extreme ones, though, you don't pick up a big, big cube of it with your chopsticks and eat it whole. You take a little corner of it with your chopsticks and you mix it into your rice and whatever else you're eating. And it just functions as a condiment that like just adds, you know, like a little, a little je ne sais quoi to, um, you know, to, to the flavor of, of of what you're eating and a lot of strong flavored foods you know that that's how they're used they're they're not used you know um um you know big pieces of them um, um alone they're used to mix in and add add complexity to flavor two unlocks there that i think people need to to listen to because i'm like you i'm always trying to break through people's it, no i'm always trying to break through the no i'm not into that have you tried it no i haven't okay let's talk about that so cheese there are some descriptors for cheese that are like sweaty gym socks. And you're like, yep, sign me up. I want sweaty gym <laughs> sock cheese. Yet you have some of the funkiest, stinkiest cheeses and they're sweet and they're delicate and silky smooth on the palate. And so I think it's an interesting just like sensory journey. So that's one thing. If you like cheeses, if you go to the Murray's cheese section and be like, what's something new, something interesting? you are already in the space with your palate to go and get some of those products. So I think that's one thing that I think is very important for people to recognize if you're into those cheeses. The other is I think when people think of the fermented food product, they think of it like a side, like you're going to get barbecue and you're getting a thing of mac and cheese or potato salad or pasta salad, and you're just going to consume that product. It's an accompaniment. Yes, but it's very different to your point. It's more like how much mustard are you going to put on that bratwurst. You're not gonna drown that bratwurst in mustard. You're gonna put just enough where it accents it, where it, where it complements the fats and you know that umami character. And I think sometimes people are like, I'm, all right, I'll try it. And it's like a big forkful of they're like, nope, I don't like it. So I think those are two things to pay attention to for people. I think are really yeah, good. Yeah, and I think I think a lot of fermented foods we just we have to think of them as condiments. Like they're yeah. not, yeah. you know, they're not a food to be consumed independently. There's something to to accent, uh, um, you know, something with a plainer flavor. Yeah, I like that. You uh, you showed me a couple little projects you have. Let's show people a couple of things that you're working on right now. And before you do that, actually, I wanted to, a couple of questions from the audience that I thought were good. As we were talking about China, I think it was interesting as fermented foods have come into the zeitgeist of what's happening in culinary, there's also the discussion of who and how we represent culture and the potential for appropriation of certain ingredients and techniques and culturally relevant foods. How do you see 
the need for the culinary community, especially as ambassadors for these cultures, these ingredients, these techniques, what responsibility do we have to ensure that people know that when we're representing this tofu, it's not just our ability, it's like generations of, of history and culture. What, what's kind of your take on that? How, give us a little bit of insight. Well, I mean, I think it's always important to, you know, sort of acknowledge where, you know, where these processes come from, like where the, you know, where the ancient cultural wisdom that, you know, enables us to do these things comes from, um, um, you know, but, you know, I, I, I mean, I also feel like food is a, is, is a realm where there's just been an incredible amount of, you know, cross pollination, you know, beginning with, you know, the, 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 the transfer of seeds and the, you know, the spread of crops around the world. So, I mean, I think it's always important to, you know, sort of acknowledge where things come from. Um, but, but I mean, you know, I, I, I I personally think that um, you know cross pollination is inevitable and desirable, and um, and I think that you know our our food is really enriched by drawing on um, a multiplicity of influences, and um, and I mean you know I mean personally I, I just think you know Chinese food is you know just one of the greatest cuisines in the world, and I draw a lot of inspiration from it, and you know in the the two weeks of my life that I spent in China, I just learned so much. And it sort of influenced how, you know, my day-to-day -day, uh, uh, food preparation um, uh, in, in many ways, uh, fermentation and beyond. It's good. I like that. And give credit where credit due, I think, is important. I think too often if we say this is this is my food versus this is the amalgamation of all of my personal experiences, influences, and inspirations is a huge opportunity. So I think that, and just the more that we play, the more food that I eat from people of different cultures, the more I learn about them, the more I love them. But for me personally, the end, like that's the punchline for me. And so I think I love the fact that we can get introduced to new things. Uh, so and then hot sauce, John Lendorf, great writer, also is the one who named the Flatirons Food Film Festival. That's amazing for a writer. John, the alliteration, I stumble on it all the time with the four Fs. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> but uh, hot sauce, they're talking about this is a big year, especially in Colorado. Great chilies grow here in Colorado. Uh, suggestions, easy way to ferment chilies in a hot sauce. What's, uh, what's your go-to tip for somebody looking to make hot sauce? Sure. A great so gateway into fermented foods, by the way. So I mean, I, I basically go for um, um, like a like a chili garlic paste. Like that, that's my go-to. Is I, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I, right, right now I have a lot of chilies in my garden. Also, I have, um, um, you know, some like long cayennes and jalapenos. Um, and um, uh, uh, you know, what what I typically do with them is I will uh, harvest them, take the stems off, uh, coarsely chop them, um, put them in the food processor with some garlic. Um, and then sort of, you know, just, just blend them down into almost a paste um, and then add salt. I mean, basically sauerkraut method, just like salt and the vegetables and no added water. And so then you add a, you end up with a paste and with a much more concentrated uh, uh, flavor. Some years when I've had really hot, hot, peppers like habaneros, I've actually added a sweet potato. Like I cooked, a, I, I baked a sweet potato and added the sweet potato just to soften everything um, and, and absorb a little bit of the heat or dilute some of the heat. Um, if you like making more of a sauce, then I would say ferment them in a brine um, um, and, you know, and then blend the whole thing down. And then if you want, you can even strain it. Um, uh, sometimes people add a little bit of vinegar to it or a lot of vinegar to it in order to stabilize it. But generally at the end, after the fermentation, I generally don't do that. So my go-to is a paste. Like I, I prefer it in the form of a, of a thicker paste so I don't add any water. Um, but And then, you know, how long you ferment. I usually will add like a little bit more salt than I would for sauerkraut because I'm going to be using it in such right. um, small amounts. So maybe like 3% salt. Um and you know, ferment it for uh, a month or something. Um, Love it. It's super hot, maybe a shorter time. The sweet potato, that is a really, really clever one. Right away, I knew exactly what you're talking about. Never done that. I can't believe I've never done that. Now that's getting added to the list. I love it. What are the couple of things that you're fermenting right now? What are you excited about? Well, okay. I mean, just talking about like cross-cultural inspiration, um, uh, a couple of days ago, I made some uh, uh, tempeh, 
And um, this is, so tempeh is an Indonesian process, except that instead of using soybeans, I used corn, whole kernels of nixtamalized corn and pinto beans. Um, and um, I mean, it's delicious. I've been, I've been uh, um, uh, eating it. It's, it's, uh, what's, it's, what's, what's your go-to? How do you like to prepare it? Um, uh, you know, when it, when it's fresh like this, I'll just, I'll just fry it in some, some oil or, or some butter and salt it. Sometimes I'll, um, marinate it in, um, uh, this marinade that I learned when I went to Indonesia was, um, crushing, um, coriander seeds, making a little brine with the crushed coriander seeds, um, um, marinating the to the, the tempeh in that for a few hours or overnight or 24 hours, uh, and then cooking it. I've also, you know, I've been playing a lot with shio koji which is koji Very and nice. salt fermented together and then you you grind it down into a paste and um you know tempeh i mean i just found some in my fridge the other day that had been marinating for like three weeks uh and it was so delicious it was you know i because you know what all those koji enzymes do is they you know they really like break down the proteins into amino acids and so you know it just made the the tempeh you know 10 times more uh more flavorful i've been doing a lot of pickling um uh they're, they're, they're kind of petering out now, but I've had a lot of cucumbers all summer. So this is, you know, this is the kind of pickles that really, um, as a kid, I loved. They're just like, you know, cucumbers um, and uh, in, a, in a saltwater brine with garlic and dill and uh, grape leaves. The grape leaves help uh, uh, maintain the crunchiness of the, of, of, of the cucumbers. And then I also have a jar here of, uh, these are watermelon rinds uh, uh, fermented in a brine with uh, garlic. And, you know, watermelon rinds actually read exactly uh, to the palate exactly like cucumbers and so you know i ferment them in exactly the same way as i do cucumbers and they're delicious i love all this i like the pickles especially now thinking back to you growing up in new york in the city the bodegas have them on the corner the jewish delis have them on the counter as well those pickles uh, i'm a big fan of the uh the full pickles the 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 half sours to me I, they're confused. They're not a cucumber or a pickle, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a I'm a big fan. The watermelon rind. I love this because now we're talking about about food waste as well. We are wasting so much food. It's unbelievable. You mentioned composting a little bit, which is a great way to kind of mitigate food waste. Yet there, there's so much flavor left in there that you can pickle them. You can do interesting stuff with super sweet, like freezer style pickles and stuff with watermelon rind. And so watermelon rind i think that's a great while i have you there one other food item that you see people waste all the time maybe carrot tops or anything else that you're always like please do something with them here's an idea well <laughs> Um, um, well, I mean, one thing that I've been, uh, I, I have a friend who, um, has been raising chickens and selling, selling meat chickens. And then I was a little horrified to discover that he was throwing away the feet. So now he's saving all of the feet for me. And, um, um, you know, I, I love eating chicken feet, uh, and, and they just make the best stock. Um, so, so, um, so, you know, every time he's, um, um, uh, slaughtering a bunch of chickens, I'm getting a bunch of chicken feet, but I mean, I think everything, I mean, you know, um, 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 you know, um, 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 uh, uh, the cobs of corn have incredible flavor. Um, you know, like, you know, in the, in the early period of, 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 of the pandemic, when, when, you know, um, everyone was stressing about food, I mean, I was just saving all of the scraps of every vegetable that I used and, you know, every few days making a making a little stock out of it but you know we're really like you know we're we're just routinely discarding so um you know so many food resources and um um you know i i agree with you that like i mean it's really it's 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 absurd to be talking about you know um you know all the biotechnology we need to use to produce more food for all the billions of people when we're throwing away such extraordinary amounts of uh of, of food all the time. So many delicious things. As you mentioned, the chicken feet. I love that. I like, I usually like one bite of chicken foot and I'm like, yeah, I'm good. But what I love it for is stock. So anybody, yeah. I'm just always trying to get people think about this. If you've gone to the market and bought a $14 pint of bone broth, go get chicken feet at the market for 71 cents a pound. And it'll make the most gelatinous, rich, delicious, bone broth you could ever imagine make it yourself mitigating food waste interacting with 
the vegetables in your garden, pull those onions, pull those carrots. So Sandor, I really appreciate this. This was uh, this was special for me. I'm serious when I say that your book definitely had an impact on me personally and so many in the culinary community. And I think the work that you're doing now is very important. We need to pay attention because you're thinking a lot more not what's in the jar. I see you talking about and paying attention a lot more to what's in here, what's in here and what's in the soil and the way that we interact that way makes the opportunity for what's in that jar to be absolutely delicious. And I'm grateful. So thank you for being on the show. Okay. It's my pleasure. Let me just flash the cover of my yes. new book, which just, just arrived in the mail and it's coming out um, next month. Fermentation is metaphor. So it's a little bit more about like, you know, what's up here and, and, you know, how, how we use the word fermentation beyond the literal process of fermentation, how we use it in all these sort of figurative and more metaphorical ways to describe artistic fermentation, cultural fermentation, um, um, you know, like, you know, any realm of our lives, you know, our, 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 our emotions ferment, our ideas ferment. Um, so, um, you know, it's same idea. It's like, it's about, it's about the bubbles. It's about, um, 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 you know, excitement. Um, so, uh, such a pleasure to speak with you, Jensen. Yes. Very great. There's a link to uh, wild fermentation, your website, check out, uh, the book next month for sure. And I like this, you're connecting all the dots. It's from the soil to the products themselves, to the process, to the love, to the fact that you are Sandor cat because cat kraut, excuse me, because you <laughs> brought kraut to the party. And I think more and more people need to bring kraut to the party. They need to bring fermentation to the party because damn, that's a good party. I mean, it really is. Sandor. <laughs> I appreciate it. You okay. have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much great. for being on. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. All right. Take care. All right, everybody. Sandor Katz, absolute legend. And uh, for me, for sure, huge geekdom when it comes to fermented foods. And it, it definitely changed my trajectory for sure and so many others so to have that thoughtfulness i think is so important because you know for me as a chef i focus so much on the ingredients in the process and once again sandor challenging us to think more about the people which is the foundation of this entire best served show that we're doing is about interacting with more and more of the humans that are behind the great works that we love so thank you so much Megan, I don't know what else is left to say, but uh, how, how was that? That felt really good to me, but I'm very biased because that is just absolutely, you know, top tier guest that I want to get on. So for you, what do you th what what'd you think? What did you take away from uh, Sandor? Well, you know, I first heard about him, I think, 11 or 12 years ago and uh, made some of his pickles. And I just thought his story is just like mine. Like my husband started fermenting by doing kraut. And now he does all kinds of hot sauces and I make yogurt. And as soon as the, as soon as we were locked in our house for the pandemic, we started saving all our vegetable scraps and we make broth and like, you know, little things I'm like, Oh man, it's like uh, kindred spirits in the fermentation world. That was great. Well, you're in, well, you're in good company then for sure. Yeah. I'm glad, glad to hear that. All right, everybody best served on film presented by Bucha products. We're going to have Ari from Bucha products on the show. And uh, I actually just got some different kombuchas and some of their different products. I'm really excited. Anytime I get to talk fermentation, as you can tell, I go to the max geekdom because it's just, I think it's the, the way we need to think about food as a whole. All in one product, fermentation talks about the soil biology and that how farmers actually don't grow vegetables. They grow soil and the soil grows vegetables. That level of thoughtfulness, it's about preserving culture and history and food. It's about being able to gather around the table for those iconic family recipes. And it's about being damn delicious. So appreciate this. Again, best served on film presented by Bucha Products, The Art of Fermentation with Sandor Katz. And we wanna make sure again, Flatirons Food Film Festival is our partner in this and such important work. Tell people, I'll tell people, we need to support the arts. We need to support the work so that we can have more people like Sandor Katz out there doing the work that they're doing, that we can follow their journeys. And that is really the mission of the Flatirons Food Film Festival. So we need to donate and tell people how they can do that, Megan. Yeah. Uh, and also we have another dinner and a movie on September 18th. So 
Uh, people can pencil in Friday night, dinner and a movie with the Flatirons Food Film Festival. Uh, we'll have uh, links in uh, the comments for that. Um, and they can donate through the festival's website directly. Um, but yeah, the dinner and movies are always fun. And this one is going to be grace. It's going to be a wonderful night. Yes. Chris Duffy's movie. That, uh, that was an intense movie. And that guy, three Michelin star chef is at another level for sure. So very interesting and, uh, pop-ups. They were, they were doing pop-ups and I see a lot of chefs right now doing pop-ups as COVID has really shifted okay. where and when and how people are willing to dine. And I know you with local table tours are kind of interacting in a different way as well. The pop-up is such an important thing. It became very like trendy for a minute, but the ability for somebody like he did or so many chefs are doing to just connect with people in the most intimate way possible, inviting them into their home or going to another person's home and just cooking a meal for them, their friends, their family, and hopefully serving some fermented foods. I'm sure they would be. It's super important. So, all right, I appreciate everybody. Again, into the comments, there's a lot of things that we want you to link to, to check out books and films and series and places to donate and dinner and a movie coming up as well. So thank you all of you for watching, letting me, uh, a bucket list for sure. Somebody that's been uh, a icon to a lot of us. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Cheers.